Hi class, how are you? Um, so today we're going to be covering cell signaling um, and homeostasis. Um, and the first part of this lecture um, is going to be some very broad concepts, and these are all really important, so it's, it's, it's important that you guys um, fully understand it. Um, and then in the second part we'll look at some more specific examples of how cell signaling works. Um, so, as you guys have learned so far in the course, transcriptional regulation is, is really vital for controlling the level of uh, mRNA produced, which then actually controls the level of protein um, that's also made. Um, but then there's also post-transcriptional regulation that controls the level of protein and activity. Um, and so the big question is, what's regulating the regulators? Okay, and, and what it comes down to is cell signaling, which basically integrates internal and external cues to help choreograph the appropriate cellular response. Um, and the cell signaling helps a, a cell respond to its environment, it can guide its movement, and it can also change its transcriptional response to certain things. Um, so it's just a very, very important um, subject matter, including, you know, controlling its response to stress and other things like that. Um, so here's just sort of a sample signaling cascade. And so extracellular signals are typically um, sensed by the cell and, and oftentimes there'll be a receptor um, on the plasma membrane of the protein that can bind to the signaling molecule. And then a signaling cascade is transduced through intercellular signaling proteins um, and then these will ultimately signal to various effector proteins, either being uh, metabolic enzymes or cytoskeletal proteins or gene regulatory proteins. And these will do things like alter the metabolism, alter gene expression, or help the cell change its shape or move. Um, so Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or yeast, has been an invaluable tool in understanding cell signaling, um, in part because it's so genetically tractable. Okay, and so here's basically just a, a plain old haploid yeast cell growing in culture. And if you add a mating pheromone to it, um, the yeast actually starts to change its shape and produces these mating projections. Um, and this is what's called the shmoo. Um, or a shmoo in yeast, and so you can see the, the mating projection is starting to form. And this is what happens to yeast when it um, comes in contact with a mating uh, pheromone, and then it allows the A and the alpha strain to actually fuse and mate. Um, the name for the shmoo actually came from a 1950s uh, cartoon called The Life and Times of the Shmoo by Al Cap, and I'm sure you guys can just look at this character right here and see that he resembles, um, or the yeast here um, resemble uh, the, the Shmoo here, and that's how it's got its name. Um, so there's different types of um, receptors uh, in the cell. Uh, one of the sort of most classic ones is the cell surface receptor, right? The, the cell uh, the receptor that's actually um, exposed uh, and bound in the plasma membrane. So here you have a target cell, here you have the plasma membrane, then you have your cell surface receptor, and then oftentimes a hydrophilic um, signaling molecule can bind to that cell surface receptor and elicit a response. Um, but there's also um, intercellular receptors as well where you can have a small hydrophobic molecule that can be brought to the cell by a carrier protein and that hydrophobic molecule can actually cross the lipid bilayer um, and enter into the cell and then it will oftentimes bind an intercellular receptor um, uh, in the cell and then elicit a response. And oftentimes these are um, hormone receptors or hormones like steroids and retinoids uh, and things like that, fatty acid derivatives and even dissolved gases as you'll see in a second. So here are some of the, the forms of intracellular signaling. Um, you can have contact dependent where you have a signaling cell and a target cell. This oftentimes happens when you have an immunological synapse when a T cell and a B cell might come together. Um, you can have paracrine signaling where you'll have a signaling cell and it'll um, release a local mediator which can then bind to receptors on the nearby target cells. Um, you can have synaptic signaling where you basically have your, 
your synapse and neurotransmitter will be released and then there's a receptor on the target cell uh, that the neurotransmitter will bind and then that can elicit a response. Um, and then you have endocrine signaling where you can have an endocrine cell which will release hormones and these uh, will eventually diffuse into the bloodstream and then diffuse throughout your body um, and eventually reach um, a target cell with a target receptor um, and sometimes these can actually be intracellular receptor to not just plasma membrane um, receptors. And so in the case with endocrine signaling, it's considered really slow. So you'll have your endocrine cells and they'll release the various hormones into the bloodstream. And then these will travel around the bloodstream for a while um, and they'll eventually diffuse into the right location. Um, and the various target cells will have specific um, receptors for the different um, endocrine hormones that are, that are there. So this is sort of reliant on uh, passive diffusion throughout the body. Um, now, in the case with synaptic signaling, it's extremely fast. An action potential can travel about 100 meters per second, okay? And so when an action potential is traveling down these neurons, it'll eventually cause release of the, um, or fusion of the vesicles um, in the synapse with the plasma membrane, which will then release neurotransmitter, um, and then uh, the neurotransmitter will bind to a receptor on the target cells, okay? And oftentimes the response is, is dependent on the concentration of the um, neurotransmitter as well, on the, as well as the equilibrium dissociation constant. Um, now, in the case with extracellular signals, there's oftentimes a response, and there can be multiple responses. You don't just have to have one. But let's say you have your extracellular signaling molecule. It will bind to the cell surface receptor, and then um, you can have intercellular signaling pathways, which can lead to alter protein function, okay? You can also have situations where the intercellular signaling pathway actually leads to a change in transcription. Okay, and that will then lead to um, production of a messenger RNA and then altered protein um, synthesis. And ultimately this can alter the cytoplasmic machinery of the cell and the cellular behavior. Okay, and so if you're just altering the protein function, that can occur pretty fast um, compared to if you're cha making changes in gene expression, that, that's oftentimes a lot slower. And you guys can sort of think about that. This can be relatively immediate, whereas in the change with gene expression, you're going to have to um, assemble the pre-initiation complex, go through um, initiation, elongation, termination, and then mRNA processing, mRNA transport out of the nucleus, and then um, you'll have to go through the whole translation process and protein folding in order to get the protein um, synthesized. Um, versus here, the proteins are already present and just changes in the, in the protein's activity can change its function. Um, you can also get signaling um, via gap junctions, and this often involves um, diffusion of small molecules like calcium and cyclic AMP. And these will occur through little pores that attach, where two cells are sort of attached together. Um, now, cells are actually really good at integrating multiple signals, and it's important that they do, because under certain circumstances, you're going to want a cell to do different things, okay? And so the cells can integrate signals, so in this case, it's integrating three different signals, A, B, and C, and that's just telling the cell to survive. Okay, if you um, add in some additional signals, it might tell the cell to grow and divide, okay? Um, or other signals can cause that cell to actually differentiate into a different cell type, or in certain aspects, if you lose signals, or certain signals basically can tell the cell to die, okay? Um, in a process called programmed cell death, which is called apoptosis, okay? And so here you can see an apoptotic cell um, right here. Um, now, during development, a lot of morphogens are secreted, and, and the morphogen gradient can actually tell the cell, um, you know, what that cell should actually divide into. Okay, so if you have a source of a morphogen, 
uh, and you have this morphogen gradient, um, what ends up happening is the different cells, depending on the concentration of morphogen, will um, either become like an A cell, a B cell, or a C cell. Okay, so these are sort of uncommitted cells, and then once they get a specific concentration of the morphogen, um, they will actually divide and differentiate into a specific cell type. Um, um, now, certain neurotransmitters can also elicit different responses on the cell. It's not a universal thing. So if you take the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, um, depending on the cell type, um, it will elicit a different response. Okay, so the, um, if you have ac acetylcholine um, in heart muscle, the, ac uh, the acetylcholine receptor will actually cause a decreased rate and force of contraction. Okay, so it sort of um, makes the, the muscle cells not contract as much. In the case with um, skeletal muscle, uh, what ends up happening is the um, acetylcholine actually binds to um, an ion channel um, and that will actually lead to contraction. And we'll look at this uh, much later when we're covering um, uh, muscle contraction later on and later on in the term. Um, and in the case with a salivary gland, um, when acetylcholine binds to the acetylcholine receptor, what ends up happening is it leads to secretion, which causes these vesicles to fuse with the plasma membrane, and they can basically release uh, saliva. So the different signals can be interpreted differently depending on the cell type that's present. Um, another thing that can um, be used in cell signaling is actually uh, small gases. And a perfect example of this is nitric oxide. Okay, so here you have a blood vessel, um, and this is the lumen of the blood vessel, and there's uh, cells that actually, the endothelial cells that make up the blood vessel, but then you also have smooth muscle cells surrounding um, that blood vessel, okay? And you've got the basal lamina that's here. Okay, and, and basically nitric oxide can use, be used to actually sort of um, cause vasodilation of these um, blood vessels. And in fact, nitroglycerin um, is oftentimes used as the first course of treatment to treat a heart attack because it causes dilation of all your blood vessels. Um, and so oftentimes uh, a paramedic or um, a doctor in the ER will actually give you a sublingual nitroglycerin tablet to, to dialyze um, all of your blood vessels. Um, and here's how that actually works. You, you have an activated nerve terminal, um, which then will release um, acetylcholine, and then acetylcholine binds to the acetylcholine receptor, and then that will actually signal and cause activation of nitric oxide synthetase, or NOS. Okay, and the nitric oxide synthetase um, will convert arginine to nitric oxide. And then the nitric oxide is a small gas. It can rapidly uh, diffuse across membranes. Um, and then it'll eventually go to a smooth muscle cell where it's bound by guanidyl cyclase. And the guanidyl cyclase will take GTP and convert it into cyclic GMP. And that causes rapid relaxation of the smooth muscles. Okay, and so that's how the whole vasodilation works um, from the molecular aspect. Um, so this is one of these things that you guys should probably um, have a real good understanding of how this works. I think it's one of those important concepts uh, that, that I'd like you to know. Um, okay, so getting on to endocrine um, signaling, there's a whole bunch of hormones and hormone receptors and orphan nuclear receptors. Um, and here's just basically a, a collection of hormones, um, testosterone, estradiol, um, or estrogen, uh, cortisol, um, retinoic acid, and these are f small hydrophobic and endocrine hormones, um, and these typically bind to um, nuclear receptors. And we've already seen these um, nuclear hormone receptors when we were talking about the estrogen receptor in the CHIP-seq paper, if you guys want to go back a couple lectures, and we also talked about the, the glutacocortic glucocorticoid receptor. Um, and so what ends up happening is uh, these can actually just readily pass through um, the lipid bilayer. And if you guys go back and look at 
um, some of the uh, earlier lectures on what cholesterol looks like, you'll notice that oftentimes these um, have cholesterol as their sort of starting point, um, especially in the case with testosterone, estradiol, and cortisol. Um, okay, and so what ends up happening is these uh, hormones will actually um, passively diffuse through the plasma membrane or, and are eventually bound by a nuclear hormone receptor. Okay, and so these are the nuclear receptor um, superfamily. They all contain a DNA binding domain, um, and then they will also contain a domain where the hormone can bind. And like I said, if you go back to the chip seek um, lectures that we talked about um, a couple lectures ago when we were covering transcription, um, you'll actually see the chip seek peaks from the estrogen receptor when given um, the, the uh, estrogen. Okay, and so when the hormone binds to these receptors, um, they will actually bind to DNA and elicit a transcriptional response. Um, here's some other ones, the thyroid um, hormone receptor, the vitamin D receptor, progesterone receptor, and the retinoic acid receptor. Um, and here's kind of how they work. So the, the nuclear hormone receptors, um, they're oftentimes bound with an inhibitory protein. Um, and then they'll have the ligand binding domain, a DNA binding domain, and a uh, transcriptional um, activation domain. And so when the hormone eventually passively diffuses through the plasma membrane, it will bind to the ligand binding domain, the inhibitory protein is released, and then a coactivator protein can come in and associate with the protein and it'll bind to DNA, and this will actually elicit a transcriptional response within the cell. And once again, I encourage you guys to go back and look at the estrogen receptor and the ChIP-seq data for the estrogen receptor and look at how when you add estrogen to a cell, the, the estrogen receptor will actually bind to DNA. Um, um, and the same thing happens with the glucocorticoid receptor and all of these um, nuclear hormone receptors. Um, and so when you elicit the effects of a nuclear hormone receptor, you can have both primary and secondary responses. Okay, so here's just an example of the primary response where you have the steroid hormone and then you'll have your um, nuclear hormone receptor. Um, and so when it binds, it will then be able to sort of bind to DNA, um, and then you'll get formation of the pre-initiation complex and activation of initiation, elongation, um, and transcription. Um, and this will basically produce um, a primary response where the proteins are then made. Okay, and in certain instances, the primary response can be shut off by some of the primary response genes and you can have negative feedback or you can have other proteins that can go on and elicit a secondary response proteins by um, basically these would be other transcription factors which would then go on to activate transcription of other genes. And I want you to just sort of take a second here and think about all of the nested transcriptional networks that we've spoke about. Um, in previous lectures, and this is sort of a, uh, a great example of this, where you'll have a nuclear hormone receptor um, eliciting a primary response, and that primary response actually produces other transcription factors that can then go on and bind to other regions in the genome um, and elicit a secondary response. Um, now you can also have ion channel coupled receptors, I and mean, we sort of mentioned this uh, before with muscle contraction and acetylcholine, um, but the way it would basically work is you have an ion channel, and then you can get a signaling molecule, and the signaling molecule will cause a change in conformation, and the ion channel will actually open up, and then you can get passive diffusion of the ions down um, the chemical gradient. Um, so there's a whole bunch of these um, ion channels. A really well-known one um, is actually called GABA, um, and we'll talk about GABA later on um, in the term when we're talking about um, uh, basically uh, nerve cells and, and synapses and things like that. Um, another very common receptor is called a G-protein coupled receptor. Okay, and 
uh, G-protein coupled receptors are often uh, abbreviated GPCRs, um, and these are really common. I think there's over 700 different G-protein coupled receptors in a mammalian genome. Um, and one of the things that make these things um, uh, sort of characteristic is that they have seven transmembrane domains. So I'll leave it up to you guys to count them, but there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven transmembrane spanning alpha helices. Um, and they're basically called G protein coupled receptors because they actually signal through a G protein. Um, and to distinguish the G proteins that are associated with a G protein coupled receptor, I'm actually going to call them trimeric G proteins because they actually have an alpha, beta, um, and a gamma subunit. Okay, and so when you have a G protein coupled receptor, it will bind to um, a signaling molecule, it will bind to the G protein coupled receptor, and then it will activate the G protein. Um, and that causes an exchange of GDP for GTP, um, and then they can go on to um, activate downstream enzymes. Okay, um, now one of the important things I want you guys to all think about, especially those of you guys who are headed for a career in medicine, uh, these G-protein coupled receptors are actually um, of high interest to the pharmaceutical industry, um, and there's actually many drugs out there that actually function by activating um, G-protein coupled receptors as well as basically inhibiting G-protein coupled receptors. Um, so I just want to sort of tell you that because I want to emphasize how important this is um, for medicine. And like I said, many of the pharmaceutical companies are trying to develop specific drugs for specific G-protein coupled receptors. Um, it turns out they're, they're actually quite hard to target, um, yet drugs for them are very, very useful. Um, another type of receptor is an enzyme coupled receptor where you can have your small molecule. It can actually bring two um, uh, receptors together and these can have a catalytic domain and oftentimes they will cross phosphorylate one another. Um, you know, or you can have another one where you'll get a signaling molecule and then that'll bring receptors together and then you can get activation of an associate, associated enzyme. Um, and some of the things that are uh, sort of fall into this category are cytokines. They're a perfect example. Um, and one of the really detrimental things um, in the uh, COVID-19 disease is actually you get, once you have um, sort of a COVID-19 infection, um, what ends up happening is you get what's called a cytokine storm. So cytokines are actually signaling molecules that are used in the immune response, and this cytokine storm causes a heightened immune response in certain individuals um, that have basically uh, uh, gotten COVID-19, um, and this is what's really causing all of the hospitalizations and all of the deaths. Um, and they're using a, a steroid called dexamethasone to actually turn down this um, cytokine uh, storm in various patients. Um, and it's actually proving to be quite effective. Um, okay, so here's just a hypothetical signaling cascade. Uh, you know, you will have a signaling molecule and that will bind to a receptor protein. Then oftentimes you have a scaffold protein where then you'll have various uh, kinases or something um, or, you know, small G proteins which will relay the signal. Then you can get transduction and amplification of that signal. Um, and then oftentimes you will get uh, where signals are actually integrated, um, and then they can spread to other signaling cascades. Um, you can have anchor proteins, which will hold the proteins in place, um, and then you can have modulators of that response, and ultimately what you're going to have is an activated effector protein, which can then lead to changes in gene expression. Um, and oftentimes during the spread too, um, where you know, signals are being sort of spread out. You can actually get changes in protein activity, which can change the cytoskeleton of the cell, which we'll talk about in next week's lecture, um, which can then change the sh cell shape and other things like that. Um, but let's focus right now on these sort of relay switches because there's, there's two main types of relay switches. Okay, there's um, the kinase cascade, where you'll have a protein kinase, where you'll have your signaling molecule, and then you'll get a signal in, 
and that will activate a protein kinase and basically lead to phosphorylation of that protein and then that will can give a signal out and then the whole process is reversed by a protein phosphatase which removes the phosphate from the protein and puts it back in its resting state. Okay so this is signaling by phosphorylation um, but then you can also have signaling by GTP binding and we've already talked a lot about G proteins but I really want to emphasize this once more. You'll have a small G protein um, in its sort of inactive state where it's bound with uh, GDP and the signal will come in and the GDP is exchanged for GTP um, and that will actually signal out. And if you guys remember back to when we were sort of covering protein um, structures in lecture three, I talked about RAS and the switch loop uh, or the switch helix that's there and so when it's bound to GDP there's a change in conformation and you'll get a signal out um, and then this will actually return to its resting state by GTP hydrolysis where the GTP goes to GDP. Okay so these are two very important relay switches. I really want you guys to, to know and understand how these work. They come into play at different points um, in the cell but ultimately it's really straightforward case with the kinases um, and phosphorylation signaling, you'll have a protein um, in sort of its resting state, a kinase will add a phosphate, a protein, phosphatate will, protein phosphatase will return it back to its resting state. In the case with G proteins, it's inactive in its GDP bound form, you'll get a signal in, there's exchange for GDP to GTP, um, and then the, it will get the signal out and then the GTP is hydrolyzed back to um, its resting state where the G protein is in its GDP form. Okay, and these come into play all over the place within the cell. Um, now in the case with G protein specifically, uh, you'll have an inactive form in its GDP bound form and the, there's a, a, um, a GEF or a guanine nucleotide exchange factor um, which actually catalyzes the exchange of GDP for GTP making it um, active. Okay, so this is a monomeric G protein right here. Um, and then the, this can actually cause hyd hydrolysis of the GDP back to, the GTP back to GDP, and that's facilitated by a GAP protein or a GTP activating protein. Okay, so know your GAPs and your GAPs and what they do and how they function um, in uh, G protein signaling because this is actually really important and we're going to see these small G proteins um, throughout the term. We've already seen them um, in translation when we we're looking at um, EIF2 and some of the other uh, translational regulators um, and we've talked about them before. So it's just a very, very important thing. If you guys leave this course knowing one thing, I want you to know your G proteins, okay? Um, now in the case with phosphorelays, they're pretty similar where you'll have a, a molecule bound to a receptor and actually the receptor can oftentimes be the kinase um, and it can lead to um, a phosphorelay event where eventually um, a kinase is going to use the gamma phosphate of ATP and actually add it to a protein um, which then can elicit downstream signals. Okay, and multiple um, plasma membrane receptors can actually um, integrate signals in this process where a protein downstream can actually be phosphorylated on multiple different residues, okay? And so ultimately, um, signaling cascades can, can integrate multiple signals um, and oftentimes these uh, sort of kinase cascades are arranged such that there's just a downstream player. Okay, and they're oftentimes held together by scaffold proteins where you'll have um, basically your receptor and then you can have a scaffold protein and then all of your intracellular signaling proteins. And then when you get a signaling molecule, the receptor becomes activated. And like I said, the receptor can oftentimes be a kinase and it can phosphorylate a downstream protein, which then makes it active um, and then it can phosphorylate um, the next protein downstream and so on and so on. And you guys have probably all had the MAP kinase cascade and this is sort of a perfect example of that.
Okay. Um, the receptors themselves can also function as scaffolds where you'll have an inactive receptor and then when a, a signaling molecule binds, um, it can oftentimes become phosphorylated and this, um, the phosphorylation can actually serve as a docking site for other proteins and other kinases um, that can then elicit downstream signals. And we'll see examples of this um, in uh, sort of the, the second part of today's lecture. Um, you can also have the lipids modified in the, on the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane um, and these can serve as docking sites. Okay, so this is basically phosphoinositide docking sites. So you can have an active receptor um, and then once you get the, um, and typically your phosphoinositides are in their sort of bisphosphate form. Um, and then you'll get a signaling molecule that will activate it and then um, you'll end up with hyperphosphorylated phosphoinositides and then the intercellular um, signaling proteins can actually bind to those phosphoinositides in, um, on the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane and these can lead um, to downstream signals. Okay, so not only do you have phosphorylation of proteins for signaling, you oftentimes have phosphorylation of lipids and we'll, like I said, we'll see this again um, uh, in the second part of today's lecture. Um, and so ultimately what you end up getting with um, intercellular signaling are a whole bunch of different interactions, okay? And so here's um, some interactions that occur with insulin signaling. So you'll get um, insulin binding, then you'll have an activated uh, receptor, and then this is the IRS protein, which is actually a docking protein, and it becomes phosphorylated. And then you'll have um, GERB2 here, which is an um, adapter protein, and you have this SH2 domain, which can bind to um, a phosphotyrosine, and then you, um, this will actually help to localize um, son of seven, son of sevenless here, which we'll talk about also later on, and that can also associate with the phosphoinositide docking sites, and then that will assemble actually a scaffold protein onto it. Okay, so this is just sort of um, a an example of of this um, and how sort of these molecular interactions are arranged in signaling, and some of the important uh, domains that you need to know, the SH2 domain, then you also have SH3 domain, um, there's the uh, PTH, or the PH domain, uh, which is the plextrin, um, the plextrin homology domain, and also the phosphotyrosine binding domain, or the PTB. Um, and so you can have all of these different uh, domains present on proteins, and then once certain proteins are phosphorylated, these things can actually bind to them. Um, now, another important thing with um, cell signaling is the dose response, okay? You can have a gradual uh, response, which is sort of shown in blue, and as the concentration of the signaling molecule goes up, the actual response goes up. Um, but then you can also have abrupt changes where, you know, there's, um, you reach sort of a critical concentration and then you get a change in the, in the signaling response, okay? And this is oftentimes called an all or none response versus sort of a gradual response. Um, and so here's the difference between the gradual and abrupt. As you're looking here um, at the increased concentrations of progesterone and activation of the MAP kinase cascade. If you have sort of a gradual response, more cells, all the cells will sort of respond equally um, and increase with increasing concentration of progesterone. In the case with um, an all or none response, what ends up happening is the cell will basically go from either active or inactive. There's no in-between and no gradual response. Once there's enough progesterone around, it will trigger a couple of cells, and then as the concentration goes up, more cells will be triggered, and eventually when you get to high concentration, all of the cells become triggered. Okay, so this is just gradual versus abrupt. Um, and a lot of times the gradual versus abrupt actually has to do with 
um, the number of allosteric interactions that are required. Okay, if you just have one, it's pretty gradual. If it requires a couple, it's gradual. And then if you actually start to increase the number, it basically becomes um, an all or none response there. Um, now, just like in sort of transcriptional networks, uh, you can have feedback in signaling networks. Okay, you can have positive feedback where the stimulus will come in, that activates A, A activates B, and then active B causes A to become more active, leading to more B, and you get this positive feedback. You can also have negative feedback where the stimulus will come in, that activates A, A actually will activate a repressor of A, um, which is B right here, and then B will come back and inhibit the activity of A. Okay, and so once again, you can have um, positive or negative feedback in signaling. Um, here's an example of positive feedback and amplification of a signal. You'll have your signaling um, ligand here. It will bind to an inactive enzyme, and once it's bound, the enzyme becomes active, and it will take an enzyme substrate and convert it to the product here, and then the product actually has uh, positive feedback and an allosteric interaction, making the enzyme even more active, which will produce more of the product. Okay, so this is sort of a, a good sort of example of how positive feedback works. Um, and here's uh, the response that would oftentimes happen. You can have your inactive um, E kinase, you'll get a signaling kinase, and that will cause the inactive E kinase to become active and then in, and it gets its phosphorylation and then this will actually lead to positive feedback on E driving more and more E into um, its active form. Okay, and this becomes very important in things like the cell cycle and other things like that where you basically want all of your kinases to be active or all of your kinases to not be active, okay? And so you will see examples uh, just like this when we get to um, the cell cycle. But ultimately what happens is uh, in the response, you'll get your signal. Um, if there's no feedback, the signal will then go down when the signal is lost, okay? In the case with um, positive feedback, once the signal is there, um, it elicits the response, and even if the signal goes away, the response remains high, okay? Um, and just for a thing, and we'll see this in the next slide here, the I rate here is a phosphatase. It's going to actually remove that phosphate and drive the activated E kinase back to the inactive E kinase. Um, now, the opposite of the positive feedback is actually negative feedback, and the way negative feedback works is um, pretty simple. Uh, you'll have your signaling kinase. It will take your um, E kinase and actually cause it to become activated, and it gets phosphorylated. And then with some delay, the E kinase can actually go um, and basically add a phosphate to an inactive phosphatase. Okay, and so once the inactive phosphatase is phosphorylated, it becomes active and it drives the phosphorylated activated E kinase back to its unphosphorylated um, inactive E state. Okay, and so we'll see this again when we look at the, um, at the cell cycle, but what you'll have is an E, um, it gets phosphorylated, and then it has a negative feedback effect by actually activating um, a phosphatase, which will remove the phosphate on E and send it back. Okay, so if there's no feedback, once again, you'll get your signal, it'll go up. Um, if you have basically negative feedback with a short delay, you'll get a, um, a little blip, um, and then when the signal's lost, it's lost. Um, but if you have negative feedback with a long delay, when the signal's there, you'll actually get oscillations. Um, and we've seen this oscillation with negative feedback in sort of the circadian oscillator and, and in other sort of uh, transcriptional uh, negative feedback, the oscillations that we observe. Same thing happens with signaling cascades. Um, okay, and so one of the last things we need to learn about in sort of part A is um, desensitization, okay? Now, 
In order for cells to properly um, adapt to the signals, they actually have to be able to shut them off and shut off the responses. And there's a number of different ways you can do it. You can actually remove the signaling molecule. That's kind of the most obvious. But oftentimes, what you need to do is actually remove the, res the there's other methods um, to, to sort of turn, tone down the response. Okay, and one method is receptor um, sequestration, where you're actually taking your receptor molecule and you can actually endocytose it. Um, and so there's uh, basically no receptor left on the plasma membrane um, to respond. You can actually cause receptor downregulation, where the receptor can be endocytosed and then it can actually be trafficked to the lysosome, where it's actually degraded. So you're, you're um, removing receptor through um, proteolysis. Uh, you can get receptor inactivation where the receptor um, and the response element are blocked by some sort of inhibitor protein, um, or you can get basically inactivation of downstream signaling molecules. Um, and then ultimately you can also uh, cause activation of an inhibitory protein, so basically get negative feedback to prevent um, further activation. Um, and so you'll need all of these sort of desensitization things so the cells can adapt to the signals and don't get overloaded, okay? Um, and you can sort of think about it as sort of an on-off switch, um, you know, to, so that the signal can be attenuated. Um, and there's multiple different mechanisms here, not only just removal of the signaling molecule, but these processes as well. Um, so that's all I have for um, part A of this. Uh, and in part B, we'll actually start to look at some specific um, signaling cascades and some of the things that they elicit. So, okay.